The New Testament reading is from Acts, chapter 16. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing beseeching him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Setting sail, therefore, from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of Macedonia and a Roman colony. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we were supposed there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to give heed to what was said by Paul. And when she was baptized with her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. The place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had the spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by soothsaying. She followed Paul and us, crying, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul was annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I charge you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs which it is not lawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's fetters were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Men, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once with all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them and he rejoiced with all his household that he had believed in God. This is the word of God for the people of God. This so much in this uh, great story, it reminds us how Bible works, right? There's not um, one little pithy phrase here that you would cross stitch and put above your mantle. It's the whole story. A revolution comes to the city of Philippi and various things happen on various days. And from it, we, uh, we ponder what the beauty of the heart of God is like, what the beauty of the Christian life is like, what's required of us. It begins with uh, Paul has a dream. God speaks to him when he's asleep. Here's a voice saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Come over to Macedonia and help us. I mean, a lot of the Christian life is hearing the cry for help. 
We can hear it when we're awake. We can hear it if we're awake. The Christian life is hearing cries for help. How do we respond? I think the other day is so harrowing to think about children barricaded in a schoolroom in Texas texting messages out, please help us, please come, please help us. On Monday night of this past week, we heard a, a really cool, inspiring report. If you missed it, it's online. You have no excuse now. You've got something to do Monday, Monday night. You can watch it online. We had a report of our team uh, that had gone to Poland to uh, review our work there with Ukrainian refugees. It was really moving and amazing. We've got so much more work to do. Lisa and I are going to go in a few weeks. Uh, two things that I think especially were amazing in that report. One is um, some of our folks said to Ukrainians, you know, back in America there are people flying Ukrainian flags and they have signs in their yard that say, we stand with Ukraine, we're praying for you guys every day. And the reaction of the Ukrainians was, really? Really? People in America are flying Ukrainian? They were so moved by this. Just like that was worth the trip, right? Just to be able to say, you are on our minds and our hearts. We are thinking about you. You matter to us all the way over in the United States. That was moving. The other thing that just got me, uh, Manolo. Uh, Manolo's bakery out on Central, the greatest bakery in Charlotte. I'd say that anyway, but also he, he's one of us. He's done a lot of church stuff for us. He was part of our team that went to Poland, and Manolo told about the day before he left for Poland, he was paying one of his hourly workers, a guy who's a baker. Bakers don't make a lot of money. The guy came in for his wages, and Manolo counted out, I forget the amount, 900 and something dollars, and the guy took the cash that he'd worked hard for, and he said, no, you're going to Poland tomorrow? to help Ukrainian refugees, and Manolo said yes. And the guy held his $900, counted out 500 of those dollars, and gave them to Manolo and said, use this on your trip. You can do your own math for what something like that might mean for you. Christians, we hear the cry. We reach out. We do something. Now, Paul hears the cry. He makes his way to Philippi, a great city, sort of a little Italy there in Greece. And uh, it's interesting. They don't really connect with any guys at first. It's women. That's one of the questions we could ask is, why, wow, on the whole, in Christianity, does it work better for women than for— it works for everybody. But why are women— Women always outnumber the men. What is that about? And when they go to Philippi, it, it's the wealthy women. Lydia, she's a wealthy woman. In early Christianity, wealthy women were really drawn to Jesus. And we never hear about wealthy guys being drawn to Jesus. What is that about? The Bible doesn't tell us, but it's worth asking, isn't it? I mean, could it be that those wealthy women, they had it all, but maybe they were the ones willing to be vulnerable enough to say it's not really enough, even though we've got so much. I don't know. Lydia, uh, she's interesting. Uh, she's a worshiper of God. And we could say, well, check, check that box off. She's a worshiper of God, but something's missing. You see, for her, God is, is sort of this vague power up in the heaven. She, she talks to God. She prays to God. She believes there is a God. She does not yet know the heart of God. She does not yet know the character of God. That is what Paul was able to explain to her, and, and she, she's like, this is it. This is what I've always had a hankering for, the character of God, that God does not remain aloof and invisible in heaven. But God comes down, enters his mother's womb, is born, he cries, he falls and scrapes his knee, he has friends who reject him, he battles pain and all of the difficulties that we face. He dies an unjust, premature 
death. Like, this is our God in it with us, redeeming us from the inside out. And the second thing that Lydia learns is that this Christianity thing, it is a social revolution. The church in Philippi, it's so interesting, at the beginning of Acts 16, there are no Christians in Philippi. By the end of the week, they've got a church. It's a little church. It meets in a house, but it is itself a social revolution. You have Lydia, a wealthy woman. You have a slave girl. She's part of the same church. You have a government official, the jailer, who is part of that church. We love our church here. I know every one of us, though, wishes that we're more diverse, that who all would be here would reflect the, the wild, crazy diversity that we find out in our world. The slave girl uh, bears mention. Uh, the, they used to have the Oracle of Delphi that maybe you learned about in school. People would go there and seek, what, what does Apollo say? Should I go into battle? Should I marry her? Should I buy this business? They wanted a word from Apollo, the god. And the guys in Delphi made a lot of money, and they discovered, let's start some branch establishments in other cities, including Philippi. So you have a slave girl there, and they come to her, and she gives a word from Apollo, and her owners make money based on this. We could always ask, who's in bondage? Who profits from bondage? We hear about mortifying things like human trafficking, that's another day in another sermon. What's interesting here is Paul, get, Paul gets irritated by the slave girl. Like, he's not in a holy, beatific mood. He gets irritated by her, so he just heals her, like, to get her to shut up. It's cool. And, uh, well, once he's healed her, she can't give words from Apollo any longer. And so who's annoyed by this? It's the guys that make money based on her giving the word to Apollo. There are always those who oppose healing. There are always those who oppose good happening in the world because of money. How often does oppressive stuff continue because of money? In retrospect, it's easy to see this about something like American slavery. Slave owners knew it was wrong, but there was so much money tied up in their plantations and the free labor supply, they just couldn't figure out how to let it go because of money. I want to talk about money and how it impacts um, what was so troubling this past week. I've been trying to find a way to say something about the school shooting, Rob Elementary School, Uvalde, Texas. I wasn't sure what to say. I was tempted the other day just not to say much about it at all or to refrain from it. But then there was an article in uh, the Saturday, edi- yesterday's edition of the Wall Street Journal. It was kind of interesting. It's like God put that article in the Wall Street Journal for me. What it said was somebody had done a study of pastors and how often pastors talk about issues that seem to be political and how actually rarely pastors talk about issues that seem to be political. And the reason that it gave is that pastors are afraid of losing their jobs. And for me, that was like a double daria. <laughs> so I want to talk about, we get confused, don't we? I learned this uh, early in my ministry. I would try to talk, if you talk about political things, you're just talking about the real world. That's what politics deals with. It just deals with the real world. So people often, I can't tell you how many, I wish I had a nickel for every time somebody said to me, religion and politics don't mix. And at first, I didn't know what to make of this. And then I realized it's a code. You know this. It's a code. If somebody says to me, religion and politics don't mix, it's a code. What it means is, you said something that doesn't agree with my politics. If I say something that agrees with someone's politics, they never come out of church and fume, hey, buddy, religion and politics don't mix. It's a code. We attach God to our political stuff. And we get confused. We're just confused all the time about these things. I've been thinking it's Memorial Day weekend. And on Memorial Day weekend, we rightly think of those who died for their country. We should do that. The question that I've had 
through this weekend has been there are people who died for their country when they went off to fight. They didn't really intend to die, but they were willing to die. The question that I have, I wish I could go back and interview them, is what kind of a country were you willing to die for? And I wonder if they look around at the country that we have today where there's so much division, there's so much anger, and children can get shot at school. Would they say, yeah, that's the country I'm willing to give my life for. So my question this weekend has been not just about those who died for their country, but who are those who died in that country by violence over time. Uh, and I've tried to think about this, uh, something I've mentioned to you before, but it bears repeating. I saw it the other day. The news came out about the shooting, and we see what we always see. It's on Facebook. You see political leaders, community people saying it. They say, our thoughts and prayers are with the victims. Our thoughts and prayers our thoughts and prayers. I'm positive of this. God in heaven, when we do this, there's yet one more shooting, and we say thoughts and prayers. I'll guarantee you that God turns to the angels in heaven and says, are you kidding me? They're doing the thoughts and prayers thing again. I do not want their thoughts and prayers. They're doing it again. Can you believe that? Shooting after shooting, after all kinds of things that go on. Thoughts and prayers. I don't want thoughts and prayers. I want them to do something. It shatters my heart to see people having to live in such a world. Can they do something? God clearly doesn't hear those prayers and come down and squash the next shooter before they shoot somebody. The Bible passage that I thought about changing to today is Genesis chapter 22. If you recall the story, Abraham thought, this is my spin on it, Abraham thought he heard God say, I want you to kill your son. So Abraham's holy, he's willing to do it. He takes Isaac, his only son, to the top of the mountain and he draws the knife and he's about to bring it down, but God stops him. <laughs> and God says, it shall not be so in Israel. The question that I have is, what are the altars on which we are willing to sacrifice our children in America? And there are a bunch of them. You know, one is, I don't know, we've been hearing lately about alcoholism among teenagers, right? We have such a drinking culture, it's so much fun. Everybody's Facebook photo, they're lifting a martini, they're having a beer. But Let's meet for a drink. <laughs> it's not that this is wicked, but, but it becomes an altar on which some children wind up being sacrificed. What are the altars? There's no one thing. It's kind of our whole culture. But you have to admit, it's hard to watch TV or go to a movie and not see people getting shot. And it's usually a good thing. We usually cheer. You know, Jack Reacher kills the bad guys, and we cheer. My son and I have been texting about we want to go to America's biggest movie right now, and you know what it's called, Top. You can say it. Gun. We just glorify it all. And I've thought about this. If all the Christians in America said, we're not going to watch anything where a gun is fired, where somebody is murdered. They wouldn't put it on TV. It wouldn't appear in the theaters, but we kind of have a taste for it, don't we? We kind of like it. We kind of enjoy it. It's always, and there's money in that, right? Think about the money thing. There's so much money in the gun industry, and I don't have the answer to what ought to happen, but it is always interesting to me that is any time that there is a public shooting, even if children are involved, it happened at Sandy Hook, and it happened this week in Texas. You go out from the shooting, it takes them about five minutes. The people that make so much money on guns speak up and say, it ain't about guns. 
I question their timing and also question this. Here's the part where I may lose my job, but so be it. It's a matter of public record. Years ago, I had a regular op-ed in the Charlotte Observer, and I wrote one that uh, after it was published, uh, this elicited death threats against me and my wife and my children. And in this op-ed, I asked a question that I did not answer. The question that I asked was, would Jesus go to a gun show and admire the hardware and say, I need two or three of those automatic weapons and I gotta arm my disciples with them as well? I didn't answer the question, I just asked it. I've had people answer that question by saying, absolutely, yeah. Jesus would, but I beg to differ. Because if you recall, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when the soldiers armed came to Jesus, one of Jesus' disciples drew a sword to fight, and Jesus didn't say, stab him hard. Instead, Jesus said, put away your sword. He who lives by the sword will die by the sword. I don't have answers to all of this, but I do know this. Uh, Paul healed the woman when he was irritated. I'm irritated. I think God's irritated. I think we're all irritated. And the question is, who's going to change the world on this? And I would not hold my breath for the politicians to do so. Why? They don't want to lose their jobs. I think it's up to the church. I think it's up to the followers of Jesus to say, this is not what Jesus had in mind for us. Jesus asked us to have some courage, to be people who want a different world enough that we can parse out the money that's involved, the entertainment that's involved, whatever it is, whatever it is, all the things that it is, and say, we. We're not going to sacrifice one more child. I have to admit, I'm skeptical. After Sandy Hook, I thought the world will change. It's not changed. We just get more and more numb to it. God is not numb. God sees the loss of one life for any reason, and God is so grieved. God is sobbing. God is not interested in our thoughts and our prayers. God wants us to be people, have some courage. We want to see the kingdom of God become real. I apologize for um, rambling. It's been hard to get my thoughts together. They're clearly not together yet. But be sure, God's not pleased. God doesn't say, oh, just let things continue as they are. God wants us to change. It starts with me. It starts with you. It starts with the church. Try to start a holy movement. It'll be hard. Everything worth doing is so very hard. Thank you for uh, thinking about these things.